So thank you everyone for joining. I think we're just admitting all of those who are joining us via Zoom. Um, Leah, if you want to just let me know when we've um, admitted everyone. Okay, so we're here, we've got people joining us via Zoom. Thank you very much for coming out and joining us for our HuntWise event tonight. I wanted to first start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet tonight. Um, for us here, it's the Pamelong clan of the Awabakal people. That's the traditional custodians of the land that our campus is located on. For those joining us via Zoom, I'd encourage you all to pop into the chat. Um, your, the, tra um, the traditional lands that you're coming to us from tonight on Zoom. Um, and in acknowledging the custodians, what we're doing is we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and we recognise that they are the traditional owners of the land. We honour and acknowledge the wealth of history and um, the important knowledge they bring to our communities today. So Hunter Wise, um, hopefully everyone in the room has heard of us. <laughs> My name is Dr. I'm, I'm Associate Professor Karen Blackmore. I work in computing and information technology here at the university, and I'm one of the founding members of HunterWise. And we have Regina, we have Erica. Um, some of our representatives are joining us on Zoom today. HunterWise wouldn't be HunterWise if we didn't have the support of our local industry. And you can see the logos um, represented up there. And it's it's really fundamental and important to what HunterWise is and why we're here tonight and why we do what we do. Because when our industry partners sponsor us, what they're saying is we recognise and share your valuing of women in STEM. We know that to be successful in this region, we need more girls coming into STEM careers. And we know it so much, we actually are going to put our money behind you and support your initiative. And to us, that's really important. Um, we're researchers, we apply for grants, we do research, but when industry basically acknowledge the importance of what we do by funding us, we couldn't be more thankful toward them. So where, what is tonight, and um, I'm about to introduce our first speaker, Cassie, but if we go back and have a think, our topic for tonight's event is STEM needs girls and girls need STEM. Um, we, I remember having the conversations around the topic, of the, you know, what we would title this event tonight and how we could try and put across through our title, you know, how very important it is to the future of our industries, the problems that we need to solve, um, that women need STEM. So I'm just gonna read out just a few things to you. And I'm going to ask you all to think about what these things might have in common. Circular saws, computer algorithms, aquariums, dishwashers, globes, the window washers you get on your car, laser cataract surgery, and humane cattle restraints. Anyone want to hazard a guess what those things have in common? Yes. They were all created by women. And we can go through a list of so many other important discoveries that we have. The contribution historically that women have made is huge and immense. The sad part is a lot of those histories aren't um, reflected and we don't know about them. Um, but what we do know is that we today face many really important channel challenges as we have in the past. And those challenges are social challenges. We can see particularly through um, digital technology and social media, a range of challenges in those areas. We understand what's going on in U Ukraine. We're looking at our new energy um, needs moving forward and we can see across all of these different areas problems that our societies need to deal with 
And it's naive to think that we could potentially solve these problems efficiently or effectively if we don't engage 50% in the, of the population in coming up with the solutions for them. And we look into our schools and we look at our important courses that will provide these minds to solve these problems through STEM, and we get concerned because we say, actually, we need this pipeline coming through of girls, girls who are keen to contribute to solving the problems. STEM needs girls. And as someone who left school and took a little while to find my career, I can absolutely guarantee and assure you that girls will love careers in STEM too. Um, so we're here tonight to hopefully make some of those careers more um, tangible to you, to introduce you to some fantastic, amazing women who have pursued careers and made a real difference and who can speak really strongly around why it is that we need more girls in STEM. So I'm gonna start by introducing Cassandra. Um, Cassandra Patelli is head teacher mathematics at Hunter School of the Performing Arts. Cassie believes passionately in the value of mentoring new teachers, financial literacy for young people, and making maths real and fun. Teaching for 30 years, she holds a Bachelor of Economics, a Diploma of Education, and a master's degree in gifted education. Cassie has researched problem solving in mathematics with surprising results. She was an inaugural Choose Maths Award winner for innovative teaching. As a Premier Scholar, Cassie was commissioned to research financial literacy education in Europe, Canada and the US in 2018. In 2021, she was awarded the Premier's Prize for Innovative STEM Teaching. Cassie has presented at several MANSW conferences about graphics calculators, money smart teaching, differentiating units of work, and engaging students in mathematics. She is a member of the organising committee of the Newcastle MANSW cluster and the Newcastle Mathematics Educators Community. Cassie also works closely with Newcastle University, having lectured in mathematics teacher education at various events and co-publishing with academics. Super impressive, Cassie. Um, so thankful to have you and I'll hand over to you now. Can you hear me if I don't use this? Yeah. Can we be? Would this be when yeah, Zoom. Can Zoom hear me if I don't have? No. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> All right, I'll get my clicker. We'll get going. We've got. To, I'm a teacher, so we've got to start with the game. So we're going to start with the game, but I'm hoping that somebody can make my internet work. If I press this button, will it just work? Do you think? I go <laughs> escape, then I open this. There's my game. Okay, so I need a volunteer from the audience. You don't have to come down and be on Zoom. I've got a couple. I've got a couple. Can I start? We can go to. Can I start with you? With the glasses, you can just stay there. I'm going to get you. We're going to press play. I'm going to get you to answer the questions. We're going to find your STEM superpower today. So future you, I want to learn about our environment and how to protect it, machines and how they work, or exploring and living in space. Which one? Would you like to learn about the most? Perfect. Okay. What sounds the most exciting to you? Giving critical care to sick patients, mining the earth for gold, or finding a solution to climate change? I hear you. What's most true about you? I like discovering new apps and games. I love experimenting with food, or I enjoy solving problems and challenges. Wonderful. And last one, what sounds like fun to you? Building, experimenting, or solving puzzles? Solving puzzles. Solving puzzles. Okay, today, da, 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 da. your STEM interest is mathematics. Bravo, that's my favourite too. Um, so some suggestions for a career where you could take a STEM superpower of mathematics is as an ecologist, and we had one just 
walk into the room, a uh, miner or a builder. Do, do any of those interest you? If they did, this website, which is the Women in STEM Ambassador website, has a whole bunch of little what's my job like cards and we could turn them over. But we won't. We're going to give Ada a go too if she wants to still have a go. Ada, do you want to have a go? Uh, we'll replay. I want to learn about our environment, machines or living in space. Okay. What sounds most exciting to you? Giving critical care to sick patients, mining the earth for gold or finding a solution to climate change? It's a popular one, carers. What's most true about you? I love discovering new apps and games, experimenting with food, or enjoying solving problems and challenges. Mm -hmm. And what sounds like fun? Building, experimenting, or solving puzzles. Okay. Today, your STEM superpower is... Oh, also mathematics. Lovely. Lovely. Let's do one more and see if we can get a different answer. Up the back there. We'll go with you, Matilda. Replay. I want to learn about. Environment. And what sounds most exciting to you? What's most true about you? I'll vouch for that. There's a few chocolates between you and I, isn't it? <laughs> Building. All right. Your STEM superpower today is? Technology. Lovely. So here are some jobs that might interest you. A food technologist, computer programmer, or game designer. And you could find out more about those. So I can recommend the Women in STEM Ambassador website. It is brand new, hot off the presses at the start of the term, and they're developing it as we go. But have a play in there if you feel so inclined. Ta-da. Now that we've done that, I'm just going to let you read this. I'm not going to walk too far because they are all rouse on me. The out of the Zoom picture. And I, this one's for the parents and other people in the audience that are not school students. I want you to think about what you imagine life is like for the young people in our room today, 20 years in the future. Just give me a little nod if this resonates with you. We want them shaping our world. So these are some scary figures. Um, I went into the Girls in STEM Toolkit to have a look there, and contrary to what is happening at Hunter School of the Performing Arts, where you know, our girls do everything, <laughs> well, we're mostly girls. And we have more advanced students than standard students. And I think only Meriwether can say that as well as us in this area. But we're, we're doing, we're bucking the system. But these are some figures that really scare me. For every year 12 advanced maths boy, there's only half a girl. Boys outnumber girls three to one in physics. I wonder, uh, I met someone on the way in who's doing engineering in year 11. Where did she go? Kira. How many boys are in your class? All females. Yeah. And Australian universities, of the STEM graduates, only 16% are women. So we've, we've got improvements that we can make. And what's the problem with this? Well, if only half the population is contributing to the best solutions, they're not really necessarily the best solutions. So what's our school doing to change that? Well, we've got lots of things happening, lots and lots of things, but I just wanted to share a couple with you. So this is Olivia Virtue. She's in year 10 now, and she had entered the Investigating with Maths competition last year through the Maths Association, and she's our second national winner. And we've also had an international winner in this competition. But this competition says, just take a passion project, sounding familiar, come to wise people and do some research about it. And her particular research was to stand outside Woolworths and see who sanitised. Who do you think it was? Was it the young people, the middle-aged people, or the older people? Who was doing it? Yes, it was the older people. Who was next, though? It was you. Yay! 
yes, it was the young people and, and then us not so uh, conscientious people. Um, but she made an excellent presentation or research from what she was interested in. And this is our Maths and Milo program. It happens every day. You can come to school early and do some extra maths for fun. And there will be, well, there used to be people from the university. Sometimes we have people from the university that are learning to be teachers. And we have teachers, but we also have peer tutors. So our best year 10 students look after our little ones. And our little ones start at year three. So sometimes they're so cute. And sometimes they spill their Milo. <laughs> That's a Milo. Um, we're also a money smart school, which means we take financial literacy very seriously. Because um, financial abuse is a really big thing in our country and we want people that can balance their checkbooks but we also want people who know how to save and make their own way in life and we do a lot of vertical whiteboarding now the research behind that suggests that when you're standing up at a whiteboard and you can rub it out that really appeals to girls and collaborating and solving problems together is very female friendly but it also means we can play at maths, and we do like to play at maths. This is a rhombi posi dodecahedron. Say that ten times fast. Good luck to you. And this is our uh, oh oh. <laughs> Didn't even think about that when I put the photo up. Someone in our audience is in that photo. Only one though. Um. This is our maths elective, which hardly any schools get to do, um, called Maths Caps Creativity and Problem Solving. So, oh, and, and this is the Hunter Wise Average. Someone in our audience is in that photo too. Lovely. Okay, so my tips for you as parents and community. These are some things you can do to make sure we're growing little STEM stars. Watch your words. Um, I was somewhere the other day where they were playing with Lego bricks. And the mum said to the, the little girl, oh, that's so pretty. Look at the house. Oh, is that a bridge? You could be an engineer. Mm. To the boy. So watch your words. Be careful because anyone can be an engineer. And anyone can make a pretty house. Um, and encourage curiosity. Because... STEM is all about solving problems, isn't it? You've got to be curious before you find a passion, before you can solve a problem. Growth mindset, anyone can do well in STEM subjects. Problem solving and grit. Now, the thing about maths is the reason people don't do maths is because it's hard. Who's ever found maths hard? It's hard all the time. But you've got to persevere. That's why it's one of the best indicators of university success. If, if you can get through the hard maths, you can, you can do anything. So grit. And lastly, coding is cool. And we need more girls coding. We really do. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for having me. I hope you had a little bit of fun. Thank you, Cassie. I feel um, you seem to be having way too much fun. As a, as a teacher, I, I think we see a lot about the hardships and it's really inspiring to see a teacher with so much passion for what they do. And um, if we could bottle you and send you everywhere, it would be amazing. And so thank you um, because you are the per it's people like you that make such a difference. And I think many of us probably sitting here as adults will be able to think back to an important person in their life that made a difference. And often it's been a teacher in a school who's done exactly that thing, encouraged the really, you know, critical things that lead to people's, you know, making different choices. Parents are the first teachers. This is true. And I love what I, I, I obviously come from computing and IT. And so, yes, coding is absolutely flipping cool. Um, and there's no doubt about that. And some are, I think some of the coolest jobs that we will see coming into the future um, we are very, very way past the days where, you know, people who did coding sat in basements and lived with their parents into their 30s. Those days are gone. Um, they're driving Lamborghinis and they're 22 right now. These um, days, if you want to not be living in the basement, 
Probably. Yes, you probably should be coding. That's exactly right. And, you know, the number of stories that we see of tech entrepreneurs, um, because really it's, it's fundamentally changing what we do. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, that was amazing. And um, hopefully there was some content in there and we'll get to ask you some questions at the end. So if anything that came, comes up in either or any of our talks from our speakers, make a little mental note of them because I'll bring them all up the front at the end and we can all um, apply them for information. Um, so I'm going to move on now to Sarah and invite Sarah to come and speak to us. So we're very lucky to be joined by Sarah Wallace. Um, Sarah is a co-founder of Script and Script is a local financial tech. So that's a fintech for those in the know, a fintech startup taking on the new frontier of open banking. Sarah has worked at the ever-evolving intersection of IT and financial management for more than 20 years, building countless bespoke, bespoke solutions for medium and large enterprises while in senior roles at the NIB and QValent, a wholly owned Westpac subsidiary. A proud Newcastle local, Sarah holds both a computer science degree and an MBA from the University of Newcastle. So thank you for coming and speaking to us, Sarah, and I'd like to invite you up now. Thank you. So firstly, I don't have a Lamborghini, sorry, but I do love my name quite a lot. <laughs> So first I'd like to thank Hunterwise for inviting me to speak today and for all of you to come along and listen. It is great to see so many young women interested in STEM careers and everything they have to offer. Technological advances can change the nature of society. Sorry. So the people who create these technologies have the power make a huge difference in the world. It will be you in the audience who will continue this progress and influence society for generations to come. <coughs> As mentioned, my name is Sarah Wallace. I'm co-founder of Script, local technology startup and University of Newcastle graduate. My expertise within STEM is very much in the computer science and software engineering area. Tonight, I'd like to speak to you further about why STEM needs girls, share my own STEM journey and the opportunities available in the information technology industry. Okay, this <laughs> doesn't look great, I know. So these are some of the examples of when technology has failed to meet the needs of women sometimes with disastrous consequences. <laughs> and issues such as these, they can occur because product testing was done on a male default. Or an AI system, for example, was trained on decisions that us imperfect humans had previously made with bias and just copying the biased humans. So I know this all looks very morbid. And at this stage, you're probably thinking, Sarah, why are you trying to get me to join an industry that's causing all this harm? So the good news is there's a lot of very brilliant people working on these particular problems. But what about the stuff that is still to be invented? We don't want to be forever chasing our tails and cleaning up these kind of messes. So these issues, they don't happen because scientists and engineers are nefarious people who have it in for women and want to see them hurt. These things happen because the people that are coming up with these products, they just don't think about these problems. They don't test for them and they don't fix them. So we each have our own unique lived experience. Now this controls how we see and interact with the world. 
The more diverse the experience of people driving technological development, the more this innovation takes into account the experience of the general population and no one gets left behind. So this is why we need more women and for that matter, people of all gender, racial, ability, backgrounds to be in the room when these technologies are being developed and to invent new technologies. Don't shortchange anyone. For a future that is fairer and safer for all, STEM needs girls and girls need STEM. So who am I up here to be telling you about all this anyway? So after doing as many STEM subjects as they would let me do in school, I came straight to the University of Newcastle to get my computer science degree. Five years ago, I went back to the University of Newcastle to get my MBA. They'd say, I love being a student and I'm a big fan of this university. I was very lucky to be able to start my working career while I was studying at Kivalent, a company that offers online payment solutions, which back then was the start of online payment solutions, so it was a pretty big deal. I started my career in quality assurance team. So that is where you get the new code from the developers and check it that it's not going to erase all the money from anyone's bank account before it gets out to a customer. Throughout my career, I've had many roles. I have worked in technical support, software development, implementation management, project management, product management, business analysis, and probably a few I can't even remember because that must be terrible. Um, <laughs> so last year, with a couple of my industry mates, co-founders, we started a company called Script. So Script is, again, in the financial space. That is pretty much where I had most of my career. And our products are taking advantage of the Australian government's open banking initiative. So that is where you have your bank account and you own your data. So it's a very positive move on the part of the government that's giving power back to the people. Now, it's all very well and good to have some data, but this is where people like me and in the future, people like yourself go, okay, so you can get this data, but how is this going to be of use to the people that own it? So at Script, we are looking to create products that can actually use this data rather than just having a bunch of APIs that mean nothing to no one, except for people trying to get you to buy things. A day in the startup world in script will see me wearing many hats. So I will do the software development, I will work on the technical design, do some of the testing, I'll need to talk to my customers and investors, and there is also a lot of less exciting things like doing payroll and being the person responsible if there are no pens and tissues in the office. <laughs> so despite having been in the industry for a long time now, I'm still just as excited about every new opportunity that comes up as I was when I first came out of university. And like you here in the audience deciding your future career, I also want to change the world when I grow up. <laughs> so that is where STEM has taken me. But why did I get into a STEM career in the first place? I'd say there was certainly an aptitude factor on my part. All through school, I did pretty well in STEM subjects, which made it a far more attractive career choice. Now, I will say, again, Cassandra's scary statistics, the fact that STEM classes were full of boys was not a negative for teenage men. <laughs> 
So outside of school, I'm also somewhat of a nerd. So I love all things computers and science and robots. <laughs> And was always the one up at 6 a.m. in the morning watching Astro Boy and Inspector Gadget wanting that computer book so bad. But I never got the hang of computer games. So if there's anyone out there thinking, oh, this is not for me because I'm terrible at computer games, that's not true. It's not a barrier. <laughs> but that was me as a kid. Now, I was definitely not a kid anymore, despite how I behave. So why have I stayed in STEM for 20 years? So STEM is an ever-changing field, and there's always something new to find out, and it's so exciting to see the next big thing. I remember telling my daughter during home learning that that's probably quite enough Minecraft. You're never going to make a career out of making a house in Minecraft. And a few months later, I read about Metaverse architects who make houses on the internet. <laughs> and I guess the best thing about IT is you work with a lot of other passionate people. So there's a lot of past baby nerds like me that have grown up and absolutely love working with technology every day. Say I've never seen someone be a lawyer in their leisure time. So as we've mentioned, um, both Sandra and I, technology has a huge impact on the way society is shaped. Being part of the IT industry, you are really responsible for the way people will interact with the world and each other in the future. And obviously, we want everyone to be able to access that. And it would be remiss of me not to mention that the pay and benefits in information technology are very good, even if I don't have a Lamborghini. <laughs> Don't panic, Cassandra. <laughs> I do want to start and say Cody is a fantastic career choice. It's one of my favourite things to do in tech. And it's certainly an area where girls can make a big difference. While your average developer isn't a 30-year-old in their basement <laughs> living with their parents anymore, you can still be relaxed. So. <laughs> But talking to students, I do hear from a lot of students, both male and female, I want a career in information technology, but I don't know what to do because I don't want to code. So there are a lot of roles outside of coding. I have only ever coded part-time throughout my career. There has always been something else that has been my main role. One role I do want to tell you about tonight that I feel is a little bit of inside information. It is a very in-demand, lucrative role that very few people outside the industry know about. And it is called a technical analyst, also known as business analyst, requirements engineer, product analyst. Now, what this role entails is doing or taking the requirements from your customers. So you need to know people, ask the right questions, find out what they want. And then furthermore, you need to have the technical knowledge to be able to put that into a technical design that developers can understand. Now, developers and computers, they hate ambiguity. So it is an incredibly valuable skill to be able to take a customer and anyone who's dealt with customers, even in your after-school jobs, they don't always know what they want. So you really have to get in there. And to be able to talk to 
developers who have a really fixed mindset, who really just want to know exactly how we can do this. What if this happens? What if that happens? So that person is pretty valuable. They have good people skills. They have strong business knowledge. There is currently a degree which Karen is involved in, the information technology degree. And it is a fantastic degree. It gives students a good mix of business and technical. And I have been so impressed with the students I've talked to coming out of that degree. And maybe you've got leadership aspirations and you're a people person at heart. And you possibly want to look at, for example, the project manager role. So that is where you pretty much herd all cats, get everybody doing what they're supposed to do to get the customer what they want. Ooh. A product manager. So that is where the company's product is your baby and you decide what it's going to do for who. And back to the failures that we talked about earlier, product manager was possibly part of those. And there's the traditional people management. But if you can excel in any of these roles, the sky is the limit for you. These are really valuable professions with a good solid base and you don't have to touch a line of code. But these roles, they're obviously for more senior people. So how do we get a foot in the door? The roles I do recommend to start in, once I start in myself, quality assurance and technical support. Unless you want to code, then just press your own coding. But these roles, they give you good interaction with other parts of the business. So you will talk to the developers, you will talk to the project managers and team leaders, and you will get some good fundamental skills to decide what you want to do because I know it's a lot of pressure as a teenager to go, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? So, yeah, that is, that is some roles within IT that don't necessarily involve coding. But, again, we are all for coding here. So these are some links I've put together to find out more. So obviously HunterWise are pretty good. I recommend that you check them out. And the University of Newcastle has a number of STEM programs. Again, I recommend you have a look at the information technology degree. It's, I know, something that's probably not known to a lot of people, but is a really good degree to combine that business knowledge and STEM. There are also a number of online organisations that are looking to do similar work to HunterWise. They have a mission to get more women into STEM. So Code Like a Girl and She Codes, they are very much on the development side, but you can find online some lessons, you can do some networking, and there's possible mentorship. Now back to the issues that I was showing you with technology before. There is a fantastic documentary on Netflix called COVID Bias. It shows how these algorithms can go wrong because they're trained by imperfect people. And this can have very real effects in society. This documentary does a great job of explaining how this issue occurs, why it occurs, and it also showcases some fantastic female AI researchers from a range of backgrounds who are doing some amazing work to resolve this problem. And again, I would like to thank HunterWise for having me and for all of you to listen to me tonight. I wish you all the best of luck in your future endeavours and I have every faith that you will all change the world for the better. Thank you. <laughs>
Wonderful. Thank you for sharing with us, um, Sarah, some amazing roles that you outlined. I'm just going to put my hand up and say, I game and I game good. Um, <laughs> I game good, I game regular. <laughs> thank you, uh, my daughter Ada. Thank you, Ada. Um, <laughs> Yes, and, and, and you're right, there's some interesting roles out there. Um, and I think we all need to realise too that we're likely to have lots of careers. And so um, exploring all the different options is a really powerful thing to be doing. Bringing us now to our third speaker. And so joining us, we have Professor Laura Ann Ball. Professor Laura Ann Ball is the Pro Vice Chancellor, Student Experience and Academic Registrar at the University of Newcastle. She sees her role as a champion for the student voice and the student experience. Irrespective of a student's background, her goal is to ensure everyone who has the skills and desire can engage in the transformational experience that is education. Laura Ann was first in her family to go to university and followed her passion for chemistry and mathematics in studying chemical engineering. At age 16, she didn't really have any idea what that entailed, but after her first semester, she knew she had found her niche. Following her bachelor's degree, she worked in industry as a management trainee, learning all there was to know about the gas industry before returning to university in 1995 to study a Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Strathclyde. Her research focused on high pressure food processing where she spent hours in the lab carrying out experimental design, looking at the impact of pressure, temperature and time on organoleptic, um, where was I? organoleptic properties of food proteins. Following this, she joined Syngent, and played a key role in the design, build and commissioning of a plant that even today manufactures the world's leading fungicide. In 2001, Laura Ann decided she wanted to help the chem chemical engineers of the future. So she returned to the University of Strathclyde as a lecturer in chemical engineering, a role she held for almost a decade. Laura Ann then put her hand up to be the inaugural head of student experience as she discovered a passion for helping students navigate their educational pathways during her time as first year advisor of studies for chemical engineering students. She became the go-to person for all students and developed close relationships with many throughout their educational journey. Since discovering this passion, Laura Ann has never looked back and continues to apply her engineering problem solving skills to help students navigate and what can sometimes be a complex journey. After emigrating to Australia in 2011, following Scotland's coldest ever winter, it must have been cold. <laughs> Um, all Laura Ann's leadership roles have revolved around the student experience. She left her strong Scottish roots both for a job at ANU and unsurprisingly, the climate. She and her family still revel in the amazing experience that is life in Australia. Thank you, Laura. Sorry, thanks, Cal. Um, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. It's wonderful to be here with you this evening. First thing I've learned is I have to make sure the bio is shortened because that was way too long. Um, <laughs> but anyway, firstly, I would like to um, personally acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet this evening and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I don't have any slides this evening and I'm going to take a slightly different approach to, I guess, what Cassandra and um, Sarah have done. And I'm really just going to share with you my journey, you know, how, how somebody who chose a degree in chemical engineering ends up um, with the types of roles that I've had and then in the current role that I've got just now. And hopefully there'll be at least one thing that might inspire each and every one of you to pursue that all important um, career in STEM. So I, I guess one of the things you hear a lot is that people want to have a serious talk with you about your future. So when my parents had that conversation with me a long, long time ago, um, my life was quite simple. I knew I wanted to do chemical engineering, right? Um, so let's see, show of hands, who thinks they know what a chemical engineer does on a daily basis? 
Okay. Does MD want to have a pop? I'm going to let, I'm going to read out Google's definition of a chemical engineer in a minute. Um, well, I'll just jump straight to that. Okay, so Google tells me that on a day-to-day -day basis, chemical engineers design processes and equipment for manufacturing, plan and test production methods, and establish rigorous health and safety procedures for people working with dangerous substances. Chemical engineers are behind the creations and manufacturing of a wide range of products, such as plastics, papers, dyes, medicines, polymers, fertilizers, petrochemicals, and many foods. Engineering and oil industries have always needed chemical engineers. I'm sure you're not surprised to hear that. But other job opportunities basically exist in any product that's man-made. So the clothes that you're wearing, the washing up liquid that washes those clothes, and then the, the soap, makeup and soap that you use on your faces will all have been made by chemical engineers. And at 16, um, I wasn't a child genius. It's just that in Scotland, you can go to university at the end of year 11, right? It's not unusual. Um, I really didn't know. Can I say, people said, oh, you've got a typo there. You couldn't have been 16. I'm like, yeah, I was. Um, I had no idea really what chemical engineering was, right? But what I did know was that I wanted to continue to study chemistry and maths. I had an absolute, like, I was a bit of a, a nerd as well, right? Maths and chemistry really kind of floated my boat. Um, and um, I had, and back to something I think Cassandra said, or it might have been um, Karen, I had one of the most inspirational chemistry teachers ever imaginable. His name was Mr. Smith, and I remember him fondly to this day. And he really is one of the main reasons that I am standing where I am today. Um, and in my final year at school, um, Mr. Smith um, encouraged me to apply for scholarships with engineering firms. And I really thought he was mental, like really thought he was mental. I'm like, why would one of the biggest blue, ship, blue chip companies in, in the globe want to sponsor a wee lassie for the west coast of Scotland, okay? Anyway, I applied to two because the application forms were just horrific and you almost needed a degree to complete the application form. Um, so three months after, before the end of school, I found, I found myself in Edinburgh. So I live in the west coast. It was like a huge adventure getting from the west coast to Edinburgh. And I had to take myself all the way there on my own without my mum and my dad. I was like, oh my God. And I found myself at this assessment centre with people who just weren't like me. Right. Um, as you heard Karen say, I was first in my family to go to university and I was somebody from a public high school. So I remember thinking, oh, my God, what am I doing here? And I remember thinking I've got absolutely no chance of succeeding in gaining a scholarship with British Gas was the, was the company. So I thought, OK, just be yourself. Um, try and enjoy it as much as possible um, and just see it as a big adventure. And then I guess much to my surprise, can't remember how many weeks later um, I got a letter because we still got letters in those days. Emails didn't <laughs> really exist. It wasn't pigeons; it was posts, though. Not that old. Um, I was I was told that I had been successful in gaining one of five engineering scholarships um, across all engineering disciplines in Scotland. So to say that I was excited about starting university is 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 an understatement. Um, I went to university in the biggest city closest to where my parents stayed, so that was Glasgow, um, and I commuted on a daily basis because at age 16 I really wasn't ready to leave home, certainly not just yet. Um, I can still remember my first day walking into the chemical engineering department and I probably can still remember what I was wearing, which is actually really sad. Um, and for all that it was really daunting, um, it was refreshing to, I guess, for the first time in my life, find myself surrounded with people who, guess what, they thought like me. The same things interested them. And guess what? It was maths and it was chemistry. And I really liked it, right? And at the end of my first semester, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, and I guess the geek and the nerd in me just became even more so and more so. And I really just loved studying. And I guess I was in many ways really fortunate that I did have this sponsorship, which meant not only did I learn in the classroom, every summer I got to have the opportunity to engage um, in, in industry um, and for me that was I guess completely eye-opening because I had no idea what it was like to be an engineer in the real world and, and having that opportunity was really really special. University is not all about academic learning the friends that I made um, in those initial few months are still some of my closest friends today 
Um, so that social connection and what you gain from going to university and meeting like-minded people is another huge advantage. So you heard Karen say that when I graduated, I joined British Gas and I was on this management training programme that exposed me, I guess, to um, multiple engineering aspects from exploration and production. So how we get oil and gas out the North Sea, which is really cold, um, to how you actually get low pressure gas into cookers and into your central heating system. So I tell you one thing, if you took what came in off the North Shore, you would blow yourself up. So there's lots of processing steps that you have to go through to actually enable gas to be utilised in the many ways that it is um, across the globe. One of the projects that I worked on, and I, I remember this really fondly, um, they were putting a high pressure gas pipeline in from the north of Scotland all the way down the east coast, crossing the border into England, which we never dared cross. Um, and I spent weeks driving up and down in this fantastic four wheel drive. I'd not long got my P's, as you call it here. We don't call it that back home. But anyway, I'd not long got my license. And I was driving up and down the countryside tracking pigs, right? So not the pink ones that we see on in farms, right, and go oink, but the intelligent pipeline inspection gauge. Um, and what that was really doing was telling me and my colleagues what was going on inside the pipeline, right, so that we could see if there were any leaks, um, if there was any damage. Because when you put these things together, it's a, it's a significant task. And to make sure that we didn't have any costly problems downstream once we actually started the gas going through the pipeline and we had to, um, you know, decommission it and everything else. So it was lots of fun, but it wasn't enough. That I had this under, underlying curiosity to learn more. Um, so I decided to return to university to engage in my PhD. And as Karen said, um, I found myself in the lab looking at food proteins and how they behaved under, I guess, extremes of pressure. Um, and, and the rationale or what we were really trying to test is most food stuffs today, even still today, are thermally treated to kill off all the microorganisms and actually make them safe for you to eat and for me to eat. But the downside to that is um, it reduces the vitamin content, it can change the organoleptic properties. Um, so we were looking at using pressure as an alternative. So we were pressuring, pressurizing up to about 550 bar, which is pretty high. It was all pneumatic, or if it, because if it, sorry, it was all hydraulic. So water where there's less energy stored, if it had been pneumatic, I think I would have ran for the hills. Um, and it was absolutely great fun. So doing the three years that I spent doing my PhD were probably um, some of the best memories that, that I have. Um, I'm obviously somebody who likes to change my mind. Um, so when I finished my PhD, I decided it wasn't time to stay in the university. And I went and joined an agrochemicals company, as Karen said, called Syngenta, and worked um, on a plant. Um, we were that manufactured this still the biggest selling fungicide globally called Amistar. And one of the things I remember about that, um, or the best experience that I had, um, I found myself as the senior engineer on plant when we were commissioning a condenser. So a condenser's there that's to cool something down so that your reactor <laughs> doesn't blow up. It's kind of that simple, right? So we'd um, started the condenser, the water's running through the condenser, but God, the temperature kept rising. And I remember standing there thinking, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So I had to draw on all my technical learnings that I had to try everything I could to bring that reaction under control. Was it stressful? You bet it was. Um, but it was also exhilarating when me, along with a number of my colleagues, managed to work out what the problem was and bring the reaction under control. I then went back to university to become an academic, probably a role I thought I would have for the rest of my career because I was really driven by the fact that I wanted to give something back and I wanted to educate the chemical engineers of the future. And when I joined the University of Strathclyde, which is the university I had done my undergraduate and my doctorate at, kind of felt like I was home, felt like I was in with the bricks. Um, and I, I, I guess I, I, I thought I would be there for the rest of my career. I loved teaching, I loved, I loved engaging in research, but what I loved the most was actually seeing the students graduate and knowing that I had played the tiniest tiniest role um, in, I guess, their success. Education is absolutely transformational. It transformed my life. I come from one of the poorest, low SES um, uh, towns in the west coast of Scotland. We were probably on about the fourth or fifth generation of families who've never worked. So it really, truly transformed my life. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. I followed my passion in science and engineering. 
and and here I am. Um, so it 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 was just, I guess, life changing. So I guess the question is, how on earth did I end up on the other side of the world at a major university where I'm responsible to try and trying, and I am trying to make sure that thirty seven thousand students get the most out of their student experience. And I guess the quick answer to that is I took opportunities when they came along and I learned how to apply um, my engineering skills in a non-technical space. I don't do anything that's engineering related anymore as such, but I still use the same skill set in my job that I have at the moment. And as I reflect on this, I, I, I just would like to say that this is a great time to be a young person with the creativity and dedication to influence your world. You've heard both the speakers say that this, this evening. You're standing on the edge of a new world and you will be the people who help create the, problem, the solutions to our problems. Um, a world where you choose the path, make the decision and plant your feet firmly on the ground you intend to walk. And my advice is that when you, pre you prepare carefully for this road, I guess you then have to assume that it's not gonna be anything like you chose. And I think the coronavirus has taught each and every one of us that lesson. Living overseas never featured in my plan. I never thought I'd live anywhere else but the west coast of Scotland. But I don't regret a second of accepting the opportunity to relocate to the other side of the world. When my father said, and this is absolutely 100% true, when I told him I was emigrating, thanks for ruining my life. Um, so, OK, folks, he's come around now, 11 years later. He's come, it didn't take him that long. Um, but I think one of the things you maybe don't fully appreciate um, is that, you know, being internationally minded, whether that means having an international experience or looking internationally for what can help influence what you do here, you know, that's where learning never stops. Um, please don't listen to the cliches of endings and chapters. There are no beginnings and no endings, just change. And university study in a STEM field will instill a passion for lifelong learning. And again, you've heard some of these things mentioned already, the capacity for critical thinking, the creativity for complex problem solving, and the awareness to develop a truly global perspective. For me, it was the greatest intellectual adventure I could ever possibly imagine. And I guess it's the continuance of education has something that's really been a foundation, I think, in my, my whole life. New ideas, new, you think about new gadgets, you know, you've, by a, with a flick of a switch, I mean, I can, you know, a click of a button, rooms light up, screens change, you hear voices, we'll get Siri, it'll talk to you when you walk in the house, you know, mo meals are cooked in a minute, and obviously critically ill patients receive life-saving treatments just by the switch of a button. And as students today, you use many of these technological innovations such as email, mobile phones, they didn't exist when I was a student, it's actually quite scary, text messages, Facebook, Snapchat, which I really still don't understand. My two daughters absolutely swear by it, but I'm just like, what? why don't you speak to people? <laughs> anyway, um, but what we're really wanting is for you people in this room to become, um, I guess, the makers of tomorrow's innovation. We want more young female Australians to get a STEM foundation that will enable them to become agents of future scientific and te technological breakthroughs. We shouldn't be taking for granted a lot of the innovation that is at our beck and call, and relegate ourselves to being a nation of users and adopters. I think it's really important that you remember whoever invented and produced these technologies once sat in your shoes. Students who may have done nothing out of the ordinary while studying STEM subjects, but by applying their STEM skills, they were able to come up with some brilliant ideas. You heard Karen rhyme off some of the most amazing innovation from female engineers um, that are out there. Students who pursue a STEM career don't have to work for someone else because STEM skills inspire not only innovation, but also entrepreneurship, as we've heard from Sarah and the career path that she's taken. And I guess, back to myself as an engineer, I know how to set about a hard problem, right? I define it, I analyze it, I test it, and then I scale it up. But as an engineer, engineers are much more than that. We're also leaders and innovation and innovators. And I think certainly, from my own experience, I know something about changing human behavior and those leadership skills that really help you, um, you know, work and lead people in, I guess, um, many, many different capacities. I guess in my role now, thinking about the role that I've got now, I commit to a goal wholeheartedly. I lead from the top. I explain what we're doing and I'm prepared to be held to account and roll my sleeves up when and if I have to. And that is just grounded in the engineering training that I've had way back to when I went to university all those years ago. We've heard the stereotype that girls don't do science, but we all know that's simply not true. 
Some of the world's coolest jobs in science, technology, engineering, and maths are held by women. From space archaeologists to racing car drivers, I wish I'd picked that one. Then I might have got a shot in a Lamborghini. Um, <laughs> to physicists and to many Nobel Prize winners. And is it important that we, a women, women with a passion for STEM subjects, support, encourage, teach, and inspire each other through forums like this one? And it's also important that we establish a community where women can share and discuss educational and career resources for young women entering STEM fields. And you've heard about a number of those resources that are out there today from Cassandra and from Sarah. Um, women, have, we, women have made important gains in engineering professions over the last several decades. We have seen some scary statistics, but I guess from a positive perspective, you look at the census in 1970, which was before I was born, just so that you know I'm not that old. <laughs> There was only 3% of, of engineering professionals were women, right? So like 3% tiny. In 19, uh, sorry, in 2019, right? Which was obviously just a couple of years ago. The same census says that that has quintupled to 15%, right? Which is a significant gain, but it does show that we still have a long way to go, right? Um, so we've come a long way, but more to do. And look, I, I hope to this end that um, you in this audience, you will, by what you've heard this evening, will be inspired to become the next analyst, the next generation of analysts, innovators and influencers. And it's been really my pleasure to be here and share my story um, with you this evening. And before I finish, I would like to just leave you with a quote from May. You know, May was an American physician and a NASA astronaut, and she became the first African-American woman to travel into space when she went into orbit aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavour on the 12th of September 1992, which was probably way before many of you were born. But this is her quote, and I think even today it still very much resonates. Um, I want to make sure we use all our talents, not just 25%. Don't let anyone rob you of your imagination, your creativity, or your curiosity. It's your place in the world. It's your life. Go on and do all you can with it and make it the life you want to live. Thank you. Thank you, Laura Ann. And I think we all need to thank Mr. Smith. Um, <laughs> uh, because without Mr. Smith, we would not have Laura Ann here. And I'm gonna hazard a guess, Laura Ann, and, and when you're in that class, in Mr. Smith's class, you would not have ever imagined that your career as a chemical engineer, study as a chemical engineer would then take you, the career you've had, and that you would wind up being in a position where Absolutely. you change the lives or, and impact the lives of 37,000 students. It's pretty amazing when we think about those generic STEM skills that we gain and how people apply them. It's really amazing. So oh, another round quickly. Thank you, everyone, now for your speakers. I'm going to invite them because now it's our turn and we get to ask them some questions. Um, so first of all, just a quick reminder to those joining us on Zoom, um, we would love it if you joined in at this point in time. I'm going to ask you to turn on your cameras so that we can see you. And if you've got questions, if you can start now by popping those questions into the comments section using the chat in Zoom, um, we'll read them out from there. But I'll see as you do that, because I'm sure you're all frantically typing your questions now, um, I'll go to the room and invite anyone who might want to ask one of our fantastic women a question. You can also just make a comment. I'll accept comments and questions. Yes, thank you. I'm going to take... We've got two microphones. Leah's going to bring it up to you. If we don't use the microphone, the people on Zoom won't hear you. Um, so we will have to do that. I'll just wait for Leah to... Testing, testing. Not happening? OK, I'm going to run my microphone. Would you encourage um, teaching in a STEM field if you got the chance? <laughs> I think teaching is an incredible career and you're working hard to make it one that 
you can manage better. This is the time to you teach your heart, you teach your soul. Wonderful. Ah, come here. That seems to be really important to join kind of like other hearts and hearts. Okay, so I'll start with you, Mariah, and you said you loved it. I can't lie, I just think it's too much from two. I didn't do an odd I didn't think how I've got two daughters, so uh, one's in Oshu University, one's in Melbourne. They both found it hard about that year seven, year eight stage, where it was about um, applying the principles to solving a problem, right? And I think a lot of students, you might be able to comment on this better than me, but certainly for my kids, it was taking those basic skills and solving a problem. They found that difficult, but once they got it, they once they get into year 10, year 11, fine. I think this comes back to what we Sandra mentioned about reach. So throughout primary school and high school, I found that I didn't struggle with maths, but once I got to university level mathematics, I found that I was alive. So in many ways, it's probably good that you don't cruise through maths now because it's always going to get harder. So it's good that you have to actually work for it now. And I certainly think you off the STEM career, especially one that is in one of the many non mathematics areas of STEM. When you're learning anything, there's kind of three levels you can work at. You're coasting, it's just too easy. You're learning and growing, or you're like being overly. As long as you keep trying to be in that middle section, yeah, it's not a bit easier when it gets too hard. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so I'm looking online. We do have a question come through, and this is to directed to anyone on the panel. But does anyone have any thoughts on mechanical engineering? So chemical engineer that are very strange, right? So when it comes to manufacturing, all those things I mentioned earlier, chemical engineers can't do with it. And that the areas of mechanical engineering being dirty and cars and spanners and like that's we are the gate mechanical engineers work in the same textbooks I had. They just would help put the vessels together and we would look at how what size the vessel needed to be, what the what the reaction rate was, etc. Et and so I think mechanical engineering is equally as long as chemical engineering. Yeah, that's a good one. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to go back to the room and see if we've got any more questions. I have a couple of questions. Uh, actually, I might ask one and I'll let you all have a little bit of uh, think about something you might want to add. Um, and Cassie, I'm going to go to you with this one. And right at the very start of your talk, you pointed to some pretty troubling data, I thought. Um, around girls and their participation in particularly maths and physics. Um, I think it, it was two boys for every one girl in math, and we had three boys for every one female in physics. So I was just interested, and I'm hoping some of the parents in the room might also be interested. Do you have any thoughts on why this is? Why aren't girls choosing? Those courses at the same rate for the time. That's really hard. I, I think some of it is still going to I think we just kind of direct it That's really, that's really, I think that's changing. I hope it's changing. It would be my sphere of influence. But I challenge you all to be the sphere of influence that you're in the world and make sure we're making a difference because we're all. Saying anyone can do anything. I believe in all my heart and soul that anyone can do anything if they work hard for money. And I will all make a difference. Wonderful. Thank you for that. And I'm going to back Cassie up there and say with our engineering courses and our computing courses, where we have females in, our females are disproportionately represented in the high distinctions. 
Um, there is absolutely no research which suggests that in any way there is any difference in how males and females perform. And actually, when they get to university, we sometimes actually do see a difference, but it's the females that are getting now high distinctions. Um, when I saw you came to engineering, what do you think about 40 guys and 10 girls? Probably not even 10 girls. But there was only three students that graduated with first class honours, two girls, one boy. That's all. <laughs> yes, it happens. So um, back to the room and back to the chat. I'm having a look in. Um, so I've got another question which is coming through around are English skills important for STEM? Um, so does anyone want to have a go at that one? Actually, I have a similar question for you, Sarah, around communication skills in tech. So perhaps if you could have a comment on that. Yeah, so there are a range of different roles and they have varying requirements for English. So there are roles such as technical writers, so in technical documentation you've ever seen, they are the ones who write that. Obviously, they have a very high standard of English and same with the analysts and managers. The developers that I work with, some of them have been absolutely shocking. So while it, there's plenty of room for people with good English skills in STEM, there's also plenty of room for the English. Okay, so I've probably got time for one more question. Um, any, yep, thank you. Please write down here. Um, lots of the jobs so far have been in lots of technological and um, kind of robotic kind of lines in jobs. But I was wondering if falling under the STEM column, there's lots of things that also go back to things like neurology and psychology um, that also go back to robotics and stuff that would then affect that, that also tie in with STEM and like jobs that you can do? Absolutely. Uh, thanks. I'll pass the panel and say a uh, de declaration. I, my research area is in human computer interaction. And so the people I work with most are psychologists. And what we want to understand is how do we make Computers, the systems we make, how do we make them more usable? Um, and that's got a lot to do with people and the way people behave. So absolutely, in all of these areas, um, none of the things we do are done without people. So did anyone else want to have any contribute their contribution? One of the, one of the um, most amazing cases I've seen was saying that the human behavior comes together is where uh, when I was at UNESC, we had, uh, I guess, people who were qualified and saying working with psychological sciences, how the brains react and the conditions, right? So that was a real partnership between the same and psychologists. So it exists in many facets, certainly in the medical field. And you probably, I think, over the last few years, we've seen more and more and more of that comes to fruition where medicine is looking to STEM or psychology is looking to STEM to help them better understand. What can be done to improve the quality of education? Um, five weeks ago, I had the privilege of listening to Dr. Catherine Ball, who's a futurist, talk about where she sees STEM heading, and she was talking about cybernetics and where we have the cybernetics, so we have people and, and technology and the environment. It's nice that we all want to start with that. I'd like to finish what I say today. We really want to go on the initial person. And she pulled up the example of the fish traps that go on and on. So, there's lots of things I want to do that. And she said, I'm not going to do it. 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 
So wonderful. We do have, there is one question left in the comments from Miller regarding what's involved um, for particularly environmental engineering. And we might follow up with you, uh, Miller, with some specific information after the session. I'd like to bring us to a close and I'd ask you again, I can't thank our speakers enough. It's been, when people come and I think, when you share your journeys, it's very powerful. Um, it, it's really a powerful thing to do because what it does is it makes it real that, you know, I don't think, you know, many of us didn't have a clear plan when we were your age, but what they do have in, and they have in common is passion. Um, and a passion to learn and a passion to be what it is that you can be. And the places it will take you, the things you can be is quite amazing. So thank you to our speakers. Please join me one last time. And thank you everyone for taking the time out to come and meet with us here, to be here. It's really um, exciting, I think, to see so many kids, so many parents involved and um, we will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, those online. For those in the room, there is still coffee and food and tea, and there's an opportunity now, if you didn't get your question asked, to mingle um, out in the foyer at the back and ask those questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you.